I read to you once more the words that are engaging our attention at the present time, the words found in Paul's epistle to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 28, 29, and 30. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Now here we are looking at what is called the doctrine of the final perseverance of the saints. That's really the matter that is before us. I keep on emphasizing that and reminding you of that because some people seem to think that what we are taught here is the doctrine of election and predestination. Well, of course, we are taught them, but they are only parts in something bigger, something greater. The whole object of this statement is to give us a final certainty and assurance of our ultimate glorification. That's what he is setting out to prove. That is why he says that all things, doesn't matter what they are, it's literally everything, work together for good, then not automatically, but they're made to work together for good by God himself, for those who love him. These who are the called according to his purpose. For nobody would ever love him unless they were called, and they'd never be called unless they were a part of his great and eternal purpose. And the purpose is that we might be conformed to the image of his Son. So what the Apostle is telling us is just that. That because we are in this purpose of God, nothing can prevent our arriving at that complete, final, perfect salvation, which is conformity to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now then, all these other things are steps in that great ultimate objective. Now, we've been dealing with this positively, and at the moment we're dealing with difficulties that many people get with respect to the doctrine. That's all right. There must be difficulties with such a glorious doctrine. All high doctrine of necessity is difficult. And in any case, there is always an adversary who is ready to suggest difficulties and to get us into a state of muddle. So one of the functions of preaching and of teaching is to deal with the difficulties. I'm not here just to give a positive exposition. I'm here to try to help people to understand it and to grasp it, that they may enjoy the full benefits of this most wonderful and in many ways the most glorious of all the doctrines looked at from the standpoint of our salvation and our enjoyment of it. Now, we've seen that there are many passages that cause people to stumble with respect to this doctrine. I've suggested you can classify them into three main groups, those that seem to say quite explicitly that one can fall away. Secondly, those who seem to say that our salvation is doubtful and depends ultimately upon us and what we do. And then, into the third category, we put the so-called famous warning passages, which do merit a category and a classification on their own. Well, now, we are trying to deal with some of these passages, only picking out some of the more important ones, because we haven't time to go into them all in detail. And I've been suggesting that there are certain canons of interpretation, principles, by which we should meet these difficult statements. Now, we've dealt with a number, but we come tonight to the famous warning passages themselves. And these, of course, above all others, are the ones that cause people to stumble. I've always noticed that when people write books against this doctrine, what they always fall back upon is the warning passages. I referred a few weeks ago uh, to a book uh, published last year in America, a long book uh, dealing with this whole matter, and uh, 
it was interesting, not to say almost amusing at times, to see how the author, when he really was in a difficulty, always fell back on the warning passages. In other words, it really does come to this, that there is nothing to be said against the doctrine of the final perseverance of the saints apart from the warning passages. They do constitute the real difficulty uh, from the standpoint of exposition and elucidation of this great doctrine. Well, now then, you're familiar with them. Uh, the one I read at the beginning, ten virgins, the five foolish virgins, and indeed the next parable also, this third man to whom one talent only was given, and uh, I might have read also the third parable in that about the final judgment of the nations and the people who stand before our Lord and so on, the three, as I want to try to show you, really are teaching the same thing. Well, now, there's a typical example, which I'll come back to in a moment in detail. But now, how do we approach these warning passages? Well, I can do nothing again but suggest lines of interpretation. And uh, the first principle, which it seems to me is absolutely essential at this point, is that we bear in mind the state and the condition of the visible church. Now, here's something which we don't hear much about these days, but which in times past used to be greatly emphasized, the visible and the invisible church. There's a great uh, distinction. But then, what is important is, I say, that we realize the truth concerning the state of the visible church. I've already just touched on this, did so last week, in dealing with the passage that we examined in John 15, 1 to 11, because it came in there and helped us at that point. But we must come back to it again, because I'm more and more convinced, the more I go into this subject, that the chief difficulty with people is that they have not grasped this point about the state and the condition of the visible church. What I mean is this, not only the visible church today, but still more the visible church in New Testament times. And that as we read our New Testament, especially the epistles and letters written to churches, we've got to remember that they were writing to the visible church. Not to the invisible, but to the visible. The church which is at Corinth, the church at Ephesus, the church here and there, visible churches. Now, why is this important? Well, for this reason. That we must not assume that everybody who belongs to a church is therefore of necessity a Christian. Now, it sounds so simple and elementary, doesn't it? And yet there's great confusion because people don't realize that. There is such a thing as what the Puritans used to call a temporary faith, or which we might equally well describe as a false profession. How the Puritans wrote about the false professor and differentiated between the false professor and the true professor of the Christian faith. Well, now, these are the terms, a temporary faith or a false profession. And uh, what is more important than that we should realize that? I would add to that that you can even have a false or a, a spurious experience. All experiences are not of necessity produced by the Holy Ghost. The Bible itself is full of warnings on that point. But people are so liable to think that because they get an experience in a church building that it must be a true experience doesn't follow at all. We have our Lord's authority for saying that when the seed is being sown, the devil is always present and watching and doing his nefarious work. Very well then. Now here is the broad principle that we must realize that we are dealing with the visible church. And that the visible church, like the children of Israel marching from Egypt to Canaan, is a mixed multitude. 
If we once begin to think that everybody who's a church member is a Christian, well then we'll never be able to understand these passages and we'll end in a state of confusion. But the Bible itself gives us, as I'm going to try to show you, ample evidence to show that that's a very false assumption. Now then, now this is something I say which is taught in many places in the scripture. Let me give you a quotation even from this epistle to the Romans with which we are dealing. Take chapter 2, at the end of chapter 2 in this great epistle in verses 28 and 29. The apostle has there, you remember, been arguing about the whole relationship of the Jews to the law. The mistake the Jews made was to think that because the law had been given to them, that because they had the law, because they were possessors of the law, that somehow or another that meant that they were all right as regards the law. That was their foolish mistake. So he has to keep on uh, saying to them, Behold, thou art a Jew, and restest in the law, and makest thy boast of God. That's verse 17. And knowest his will, and approvest the things that are more excellent, being instructed out of the law, and art confident that thou thyself art a guide of the blind, a light of them that are in darkness, an instructor of the foolish, and so on. But then comes the question, Thou therefore which teachest, teachest another, teachest thou not thyself? Thou that preachest a man ought not to steal, dost thou steal? In other words, his point is this, that a mere knowledge of the law is nothing in and of itself. The question is, what is a man's true relationship to it? And it's exactly the same, he says, with circumcision. He says, circumcision verily profiteth if thou keep the law, but if thou be a breaker of the law, thy circumcision is made uncircumcision. And then he winds it up in verses 28 and 29, and here's the principle. For he is not a Jew that is one outwardly. The fact that a man had been circumcised when he was a boy, a child, an infant, doesn't mean that he's of necessity a Jew. He is not a Jew which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart, in the spirit, and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. You see, that was the whole trouble with the Jews. They thought they were all right with God. Why? Well, because they'd been born of the seed of Abraham, because they'd been circumcised, because they were the people who had the law of God given to them. And his whole point is, you can have all that and still not be a Jew. What makes a man a Jew is not something outward, it's something inward. It's not in the flesh, it's in the spirit. Now that's, that's his great emphasis. Now this is the principle, I say, which is equally applicable in the church. There is nothing so fatal as the notion that because, well, yes, because we were born the children of Christian parents and because we were christened when we were infants and have been brought up in the church that therefore we are Christian. Nothing has done so much harm to true Christianity as just that teaching. And everything that encourages such an error is something which is bad in and of itself. However, let me give you his other quotation. It's in the ninth chapter, the chapter following our chapter tonight. Here it is in a very explicit statement in verse 6. The second half of verse 6 in chapter 9. For they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Now there's a crowd of people. They're of Israel. They're not Gentiles, they're Jews. They belong to Israel. They're in the company of Israel. He says they're not all Israel that are of Israel. Indeed, he goes on in chapter 11 to say that uh, at that time and as at other times, there was nothing left but a very little small remnant. Just a remnant according to the election of grace. A great crowd of people but very few belonging to the true Israel, just a little remnant. Now, all that is equally true of the Christian church. And that's the principle that I'm saying is absolutely essential to our understanding of these particular passages. Now, it is because of the truth of this that we have so many exhortations in the scriptures to examine ourselves. Take, for instance, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. 
Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Now remember, he's writing that to a church. He's writing it to church members. Not to the world, to church members. Professors of, of the Christian faith. Examine yourselves whether ye be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not that Jesus Christ is in you except he be reprobate? That's it. So you see, they're exhorted to make sure of this because of the possibility of their having a temporary faith or a false profession. You've got the same thing, in essence, in 1 John 4, 1. Uh, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits whether they are of God. That's more to deal uh, with experience, of course. But it's the same principle, that we must not assume that because we've had certain experiences in the realm of the church, that they're of necessity of the Spirit of God. We've got to prove these spirits. There's an antichrist, there's a false spirit who can simulate the Christian experience and thus be very misleading. Now, all that kind of thing becomes necessary because of the state and the condition of the visible church. It's a mixed multitude. Always has been, always will be until the church is finally purified and glorified. Very well. There's our controlling principle. Keep that in mind as you come to these difficult passages. Very well, then I move on from that to my second principle, which follows from it in this way. The primary purpose of these warning passages, therefore, is to test us in that very respect and from that standpoint. The purpose of the warning passages is to test our profession in order that we may know whether it's true or whether it is spurious. They are given to us to warn us against this terrible danger of having nothing but a false profession. Very well. Now, there is their primary function, their first function. In other words, we can put the doctrine like this. Our profession of faith needs to be tested. And the ultimate test of it is what it produces in us. What does it lead to? It's easy to say things, but the question is, is it real? So the test is ultimately the test of continuance, the test of conduct, the test of behavior, the test of fruit. Now, you notice how I'm putting it. This is where the whole thing is so subtle. We don't make ourselves Christians. We don't become Christians by anything that we do. It isn't even my belief that makes me a Christian. Still less my good works. No, no. It is the action of the Spirit of God in me that makes me a Christian. No man can make himself a Christian. It doesn't matter what he does. You must put his belief in the same category as his good works. A man doesn't save himself by anything that he does. He is saved. Very well. So while we say that, we've nevertheless got to put that other side as well. We've got to say that a man must test his belief, his profession, by these various tests which prove its genuineness, its continuance, its endurance, and certain fruits and results which are going to follow of necessity. If you like, the controlling test at this point is that famous statement of James, faith without works is dead. Now, these two things must always go together. We are justified by faith only. Faith without works is dead. And the business of the warning passages is to help us to discover whether we have got this living faith or what you may call a dead faith, what I've called a temporary belief or a temporary faith or a false profession. And that's how you test it. James, far from contradicting Paul, is saying the same thing in a different way. He's supplementing it. These two things always have to be held together. Because, you see, the danger for the men who sees the faith principle is to say, nothing matters but what I say I believe. As long as I say that I believe, doesn't matter what I do, everything is all right. That's his danger, and he needs to be warned against it. 
The scripture always has a balance. It warns us against two false extremes always at the same time. Very well, then. This, I say, is a principle that is quite crucial in the interpretation of this particular passage. You see how it works. Take that verse we were dealing with last uh, Friday night, 1 Corinthians 9, 27. If you didn't accept the exposition I gave, well, then you're driven back to this, that the apostle is saying, that what really saves him and keeps him is his own action in keeping down his body. And if you say that, you're back to justification by works. The very opposite of what the apostle teaches everywhere. It's one or the other. If we at any point are responsible for our salvation, well then the credit must be given to us. The credit must be given to Paul for keeping down his body. That isn't what Paul's saying for a moment. He is using this in the way that I'm going to show you now. These passages, warning passages, are brought in under that heading, Faith without works is dead. I might have put it therefore under that particular heading. But it seemed to me more convenient to put it under that other heading of a test of our work and uh, our activity, as it were, our calling in the Christian life. But the principle is precisely the same. Well, now, let me give you some let me illustrate this principle which I've been laying down. Let's turn for a moment to those parables that we read at the beginning in Matthew 25, starting with the parable of the ten virgins. Now here's a parable that has often tripped people and caused them to be very unhappy. Why? Well, they say, what you've got there is, is a picture of ten virgins Typical ten members of the Christian church. And yet we are told at the end that five of them are outside. And that they're not admitted. In other words, they were in the church, but now they're kept out of it. It's possible to be a Christian and at the end to be outside and to be lost. That's how it's commonly interpreted. But now let's examine this. And let's examine it in the light of the principle that I've been laying down. You see, people get into trouble for this reason. That they're ensnared by the fact that up to a point these two lots of virgins are absolutely identical. The two lots of five. You look at them at first and you can't see any difference between them at all. We are told incidentally that five were wise and five were foolish. But by just looking at them you couldn't tell that. What you see is... Two lots of five girls, and each one has a lamp. They've all got lamps in exactly the same way. Not only that, they were all going to do the same thing. They were all going to a wedding. There's no difference at all there. And they were all waiting for the same bridegroom to come. And not only that, they all slumbered and they all slept. Now, all those things are true about every single one of them. And it's because of that people assume that we are looking at an account here of ten people who are true Christians. But then, alas, we find at the end that five of them are expelled. They're outside. So that you can be in grace and you can end by falling out of it and be everlastingly lost. But now look at that for a moment. And you see where it lands you. What is the difference between the two? Well, the difference between the two is that the five wise virgins took oil with them. And the others didn't. Very well. What does that mean? Well, if you take the usual interpretation, you are driven to say that it means justification by works. Because these five virgins were wise enough to take the precaution of taking oil with them, they're saved. The others didn't, and therefore they're lost. So the five wise virgins saved themselves by their action in taking the oil. That's nothing but sheer preaching of justification by works. That you're a Christian because of a good life you live, or because of something that you've done. But that is the whole doctrine 
which is denied by the apostle in this epistle to the Romans. That's why he wrote it. The whole object is to show that that is the ultimate error, to think that any man can justify himself before God. Doesn't matter how good his works, doesn't matter how excellent his actions, nothing that a man can do can justify him in the sight of God. He concludes at the end of chapter 3 that we are therefore justified by faith and by faith alone. So, you see, you, you cannot accept that as an interpretation. It makes your scripture contradict the scripture. Well, very well, we come back again and we say, well, then what is this, uh, what is the, the point of the parable then? Well, now then, wait a minute. Take this key of the visible church. And what do you find? Well, you find ten people in the visible church. They appear to be identical. They're members of the same church, church members together. And they go to the same meetings. They seem to be doing everything in exactly the same way. Yes, but uh, there's a very essential difference between them. What is that? Well, it's this. These are foolish virgins have got a purely selfish and self-centered attitude towards the whole thing. They want uh, the privileges, they want the pleasures, they want to be in at the feast, they want to welcome the bridegroom and get the banquet and all the rest of it. Yes, but obviously, they're not interested in anything else. They do nothing at all about this. They, they, they've got their eye only on the benefits. Now, that is the characteristic always of the false professor. There are people who don't want to go to hell. There are people who want to be blessed by God. They want certain things which God promises to give. They want all that they can get, but they don't want anything else. They don't want any responsibilities. They really are not uh, truly interested in the thing. They don't think it out at all. Now, that was why these were foolish. You see, they pick up the lamp and off they go and then they feel tired and they fall asleep. And then when the bridegroom comes and the, the, the call is given, they suddenly find they've got nothing. They've never troubled about it at all to find out whether they have got anything or not. Now, there are so many like that in the Christian church, aren't there? There are people who don't like a searching sermon. They say, that makes me feel uncomfortable, I don't like it. What right is he to preach like that? They, 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 they are Christians, they assume they're Christians. Exactly. That was the whole trouble with the foolish virgins, assuming. Not thinking, assuming. Taking it for granted. Not making sure, not examining, not proving their own selves, not examining their own selves as the scriptures tell us to do. No, no, I'm a Christian. I've always been a Christian. Why, I've never done anything wrong. You're, you're familiar with their talk. And they always resent anything that searches them, anything that examines them. They don't want that. They want to enjoy the benefits. That's what we are told about the foolish virgins. The parable of the foolish vir of the ten virgins is nothing but a test of profession. Here are people together in the professing Christian church. And yet we are told there is this vital difference possible between this wisdom and that folly. And it shows itself, you see, inevitably. The true Christian is always concerned, careful, examined wants to make sure the other person doesn't. The other person is in the realm of the church, but quite careless, not really interested in the thing at all. It seems to me that is the only interpretation of this matter of the oil. You mustn't turn it into wax, but you can turn it and must turn it into a concern about the things in which you're involved and about the benefits that you're enjoying. It's a very useful test, therefore, and it's a very comforting test. If you are concerned about your salvation, if you're worried and troubled about it, I would say to you in the name of God, on the basis of this parable, you've got very good presumptive evidence that you're a wise virgin. But if you're unconcerned and never examine yourself at all and resent any call to that or when that's done to you, I suggest to you very seriously that you'd better go back and examine even the foundation as to whether you're a Christian at all. The foolish virgins never like such advice. They just want the ease and the benefit. Oh, take this. Well, take the, the, the something even further here at the end. You notice how our Lord puts it. 
Afterward came also the other virgins, the foolish ones, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. That doesn't mean he didn't know about them, he knows about all. It means he has never known them. He has never known them in the way that we've seen this word always means in the scripture. I've never been interested in you. You've never really belonged to me. That's what he says to them. And he never says that to anybody whom he's ever known. Never. That's what's impossible. But he's never known this. And so we are exhorted at the end, watch therefore. In other words, examine yourselves. Take the second parable. It's the same thing. Look at this odd man, this one man. You see, at first he seems like the others. He comes forward and receives the talent. They'd received talents, he receives talent. There's nothing in the fact that it was five, two, and one. That's not the point at all. The fact is this man received a talent in exactly the same way as the other received talents. Yes, but the, the, the general resemblance ceases. There is a general resemblance. There always is. That's what makes it so difficult to know who's who in the visible church. Who is the true Christian, who is merely the temporary or the false professor. But yes, but there's a very valuable test suggested here. You notice the attitude of this man, don't you? His whole attitude is revealed to be entirely different. The first two give him their talents, they want to do something for the benefit of their master. Not this last man. He that received one went and digged in the earth and hid his Lord's money. And later on, he gives us the reasons for this, displaying that his whole attitude has been wrong. This is how he puts it. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew thee that thou art an hard man. See, that's his attitude. Reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not stored, and I was afraid, and hid thy talent. His whole attitude is one of antagonism and of fear. There's no love there. There's no desire to please there at all. The man betrays himself. Though he appears on the surface like the others, he shows in his spirit, in his heart, in his whole attitude, that he's not. And unless uh, there are people in the Christian church who call themselves Christians, who rarely hate God. They talk about the Christian life being narrow. And when they're exhorted to holiness and sanctification, they don't like it. They want to get all the benefits that Christianity can give, but their feeling is that it's a hard life, it's a narrow life, it's against the grain. They're always kicking against it. Though they're church members, exactly like these men. And it is only such people uh, to whom these words are addressed, thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap, not, reap where I sowed not and gather where I have not stored, thou wottest therefore to have put my money to the exchangers, and then at my coming I should have received him. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it to him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, this man hath got nothing, and he shall have abundance, but from him that hath not shall be taken even that which he hath. Now that's paradox, isn't it? But the meaning is perfectly plain. This man has never really had the real thing. He appeared to have it. But what he appears to have is taken from him. He's really got nothing at all. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the last parable in this chapter really teaches precisely the same thing. You remember the what we are told here about this great judgment and the two groups, sheep and goats. And what's the basis? Well, here's the basis. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was unhungered, and he gave me meat. I was thirsty, and he gave me drink, and so on. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he also say unto them on the left hand, the others, Depart from me, 
ye cursed into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was an hunger, and he gave me no meat. I was thirsty, etc. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee an hungered, or a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as he did it not unto one of the least of these, he did it not unto me, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. Now then, here is a parable that's so frequently misunderstood. That teaches quite plainly that what saved the first people was that they had done these good deeds unto our Lord's brethren, and because of that they're saved and they're praised. But again, there's only one answer to that. It can't be that. Otherwise, that is justification by works. The Son of God need never have come into the world. He need never have died on the cross on Calvary's hill. It would mean that we save ourselves by doing good. You cannot accept it. It's got to be rejected. The scripture is nonsense if that is true. Well, then says somebody, what does it mean? Well, I've already given you the key. You notice the interesting thing about these people. They had done all this good without knowing it, without realizing it. They say, but when did we do this? You are praising us for having done this, that, and that. When did we do this? Now, that's the typical Christian, you see. The man who's not a Christian, but the false profession, he boasts of his works. These second lot are saying, if we'd only known, we'd have done it, and thereby we'd have put ourselves right. Never the true Christian. The true Christian is never aware of what he does. He thinks nothing of what he does. He feels he's an unprofitable servant. The whole glory of the action of these men is that it's unselfconscious. In other words, it's this, you see. The Christian produces a fruit and is not aware of it. The attitude of the Christian to himself is, Oh, how little am I doing? How little do I love the Lord? He's aware of all his deficiencies and defects, and he's amazed when the Lord praises him or chooses to smile upon him and to give him an embrace and a kiss. He's amazed at it. But the other people demand it as a right and are ready to defend themselves. You see the difference? The test is the spirit. The spirit and the unselfconscious fruit bearing. You mustn't bring in justification at works at any point. No, no, the three parables are simply to test the professors in the Christian church. At the beginning they all look identical, but you examine carefully and you'll find that there's a very real difference. Examine yourselves, says the Christian. Prove your own selves. Make sure which of the two groups you belong to. Very well, there is our first illustration. But I must take you to a second notable illustration of the same thing. And that's in the book of Revelation, this time in chapter 3 and verse 5. Now here we read this. This is the letter to the church at Sardis. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. Now, here's the word. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. Did you notice how I read that? Let me read it again. He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment. And I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. I, that's the emphasis that certain people put on this in their interpretation. You see, what, what it said was this. I will not blot his name out of the book of life. There are others whose names I will blot out of the book of life. But I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. There are other people in whose case I won't do that. But I want to try to show you that that's a very false way of reading this verse. It's a very false and totally unjustifiable emphasis. That isn't what he's saying at all. But it appears like that, doesn't it? Our Lord seems to say, I will not blot his name out of the book of life. 
the obvious implication is that there are people whose names are going to be blotted out of the book of life. And that's the argument people bring, and they say, therefore, you mustn't teach the final perseverance of the saints. Doesn't the risen Lord tell the church of of Sardis that there are certain people whose names are going to be blotted out of the book of life? It appears to say that, doesn't it? And many have assumed and drawn the deduction that it does say that. Now, how do we approach it? Well, when you have a, a, a case like this, the first thing you say is, Is there any other reference to this book of life and names in the book of life in this same book of Revelation? And you find that there are. You'll find in the 13th chapter, in verse 8, that you read this. Revelation 13, 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. This is one of these beasts. All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Notice that it's an important statement. Now there are some authorities who say that this should be read like this. All them that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world of the Lamb slain. In other words, they argue, and there's a great deal to be said for it. It can't be proved, it seems to me, one way or the other, that we're not so much being told that the Lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, as that the names are written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. And it seems to me, if I had to say one or the other, I'd say the second that the reference is not to the slaying of the Lamb, but to the writing of the, of the names in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Well, there's our second reference. Bear it in mind. Well, then go on to chapter 17. And again, you'll find a statement in verse 8. Revelation 17, 8. The beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit and go into perdition. And they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. Now, there's nothing here about the lamb slain, you see. Here it is quite clear, and that's why I choose that interpretation in chapter 13 in verse 8. They shall go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder, they whose names were not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world when they behold the beast that was and is not and yet is. Now there is a perfectly unambiguous and clear statement that the names were written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, which means before the foundation of the world. And the last reference is in chapter 21, in the last verse, verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, Neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. These are the only people who are going to be admitted into the holy, the heavenly city, the heavenly Jerusalem. Only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Very well. What do we deduce from these quotations? Well, there's only one deduction to draw, and it is this. that the names are written in this book of life before the foundation of the world. That, of course, is to be exactly parallel with the statement that we are given in uh, Ephesians 1 and verse 4. The apostle is uh, addressing the Ephesians. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. You see, the procedure is this. These people were chosen before the foundation of the world, and their names were then written in this Lamb's book of life. The only names put into the book of life are the names of those who are chosen. And both things are done before the foundation of the world. 
Obviously, this is an action which was taken on the basis of God's foreknowledge. Now, at this point, it doesn't matter how you interpret foreknowledge, whether you interpret it as uh, so many people like to do, as simply God knowing what was going to happen beforehand, or whether you take the better interpretation, which means that he set his heart upon them, set his affection. But from this standpoint, it doesn't matter which of the two you take. You can even take that, that he just knew beforehand what was going to happen. Very well then, what conclusion do we draw? We must draw this conclusion, that if it is possible for anybody's name to be blotted out of the book of life, God must have made a mistake when he wrote it there. He made a mistake. If you take foreknowledge as just meaning that God knows everything that's going to happen beforehand and stop at that, if he's put anybody's name in the book of life and then has to blot it out, well, he couldn't have known that they were going to fail. You see, the thing is ridiculous. It's impossible. It can't mean that. Now then, there's the answer to the question quite sufficient. But notice this, in addition, the statement is a negative one, not a positive one. There is no statement in the scripture anywhere that anybody's name is going to be blotted out of the book of life. All we are told here is this, he that overcometh the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. It's a negative statement, that he won't blot it out. There is never a positive statement about anybody that his name is going to be blotted out or may be blotted out. Never. It's just a negative. In other words, what we've got here is a well-known figure of speech which goes under the name of litotes. What's litotes? Well, litotes means saying a thing negatively in order to give it emphasis. We've got the perfect example of that in Romans 1.16. Listen to Paul. What does he say? He says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. What's he mean? He means that he's very proud of it. He's just been saying, he says, I've been preaching, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise, so as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. He's not apologizing, you know. It's a, it's a negative to bring out a positive. It's a way of emphasizing. It's a well-recognized figure of speech which is called litotes. Can I bring the matter right home to you by putting it like this? This is said to be the great characteristic of the Englishman who always puts a thing negatively. It isn't confined to the English. It is particularly true of them, per perhaps. But it's a great characteristic also, I think members of the medical profession would agree with me in saying, of most patients. When the doctor asks the patient whom he's been treating, how are you? The patient is very fond of saying, I'm no worse, thank you. <laughs> very well. I'm saying these things in order to fix this in your minds. It's a well-recognized form of speech. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Not ashamed of it. I'm exalting it. I'm glorying in it. It's everything to me. But it, it's a very good way of putting it at times. This is light it is. And that's what we've got in Revelations 3, 5. I won't blot his name out. Of course I won't. He's praising this kind of person. But he puts it in that dramatic manner in order to give it additional emphasis. Now, I'm simply adding that as a kind of overplus to show you how unthinkable the other explanation is. The ultimate argument is the one I've given you, that on any show, if God has put a name into that book of life the, before the foundation of the world that he later has to erase, he has no foreknowledge of any kind. Can't have. He'd never have put it there if he'd known what was going to happen. So, I think I'm justified in saying once more, as I have said several times in dealing with this matter, take time with the scriptures, my friends. Don't jump. 
But it's obvious. There it is. No other possible explanation. Then remember your central fundamental doctrines. Never arrive at an interpretation that queries justification by faith only because you're already wrong. Well then, then come back and take time. Look for parallels. Take scripture with scripture. And you'll see that the scripture will lead you. The names have been written before the foundation of the world. And on the basis of God's foreknowledge, it is impossible that it can ever be blotted out. And indeed, it doesn't say that. It is this negative to emphasize a dramatic positive, that these people might be encouraged. That is, as I'm trying to show you, one of the great purposes of these passages. Well, our time has gone again, our last, but these matters are so important. There are so many who are distressed by this that the time I know is well spent. God bless these words to you this evening through his Holy Spirit and enable you to see that it's the devil who would twist these verses in order to rob you of the joy of salvation. There are still other passages that we must go on, God willing, to deal with next Friday night and attempt to round up the argument for this most glorious doctrine of justification by faith only. Let us pray. O oh Lord our God, we thank thee once more for thy gracious and kind dealings with us, for all the things with which thou hast provided us. We do indeed begin to see the meaning of thy word to us through the Apostle Peter that all things pertaining to life and godliness are already provided. Lord, receive our humble and unworthy prayers. Bless thy word to us and grant that we all may rejoice in our salvation and know the Spirit testifying with our spirits that we are thy children and that nothing shall ever be able to separate us from thy love which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And now may the grace of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide and continue with us now this night throughout the remainder of this hour short and certain earthly life and pilgrimage and until we shall see him face to face as he is and be like him in glory. Amen. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.